outlined previously, the new RDA is the next step in development for a metadata standard for the 21st century. It will support linked data and international data exchange. Um, in the same way as we took time to get used to the toolkit in 2013, it will take work to get used to the new toolkit in 2021. And as before, large institutions, shared workflows, and we will have shared application profiles and policy statements to help us navigate and familiarise ourselves with the new RDA. In the UK, the British Library is the lead institution for this, and I'm very pleased to ask Alan Danskin, Collection Metadata Standards Manager at the British Library, to share the latest on their implementation plans. Morning, Alan. Good morning, everyone. I will stop sharing my screen and Alan will be able to start sharing his and take us through the British Library's plans. Okay. Don't, in fact, I have stopped already. Okay. Um, so, yeah, so what I'm going to just talk about, um, hopefully relatively briefly, are our implementation plans for the new toolkit, which are somewhat different from our implementation plans as we thought they would be last year. <laughs> So Gordon's already covered uh, to some extent uh, the RDA timeline, which obviously sees RDA switching over uh, on the 15th of December. And at some point after that, um, a countdown clock will be started um, once the RDA board, the RSC, etc., are in agreement that the information that people need to implement is available. And until the, uh, and then the, the beta toolkit will continue. Um, sorry, the, um, the beta toolkit will continue to be updated as we're hearing until uh, the end of the year, presumably. Uh, there are no substantive changes we expect to the beta toolkit, but there have been some quite significant changes which have affected our policy statement work, which I'll mention later on. So a key element of preparation for implementation is the development of user contributed content or community contributed content, which includes application profiles, policy statements and the workflows. Also, as we've just seen in Gordon's presentation, there are mappings uh, to other uh, standards including Mark 21 and as we've just seen the library reference model. There are also uh, Mark 21 developments underway to try and uh, enable Mark 21 to accommodate some of the new concepts within RDA. Um, from a local perspective of course there are many other things that need to be done uh, particularly our systems need to be configured, particularly if there are going to be new mark elements that we need to accommodate. Um, if we are using macros to um, speed up production, we may need to rewrite macros um, in various ways. We may even need some new macros. If we use validation uh, tools, they may require configuration uh, or revision. And we may have to think about our import export profiles. These are all things that we had to think about for the initial implementation of RDA. So I don't expect any of them to come as a surprise, but um, and I suspect that the amount of uh, configuration and change with regard to the, um, these different tools will be much less than was necessary at the initial implementation. However, there will be a lot of documentation required. I've already mentioned the user contributed content, but there's also the um, work that has to be done to prepare materials to orientate staff to the new toolkit and some of the new aspects of library reference model that are incorporated into RDE. Um, and then there is the training documentation itself, and we will need to examples to base our training documentation upon.
So I'm going to start by talking about well, user contributed content. So application profiles have been mentioned a lot. Application profiles tell us the elements that we're going to use, whether we need to use them, how many times we can use them or should use them. And they're um, specific to particular communities. Policies, we have, as we've just seen uh, with the Library of Congress examples, uh, a lot of choice in RDA. Many things are expressed as options and the application, the, the policy statements um, guide catalogers as to what to do uh, in terms of choosing and applying options. And then there are workflows. This is something that we've used extensively within the British Library in the past. All our workflows are published in, in the toolkit uh, and some have been reused by other institutions. Um, and they are a mediation layer really between the cataloger and the instructions. They help to pull together all of these disparate as, um, elements um, application profiles, policies, uh, and just general guidance. And essentially we're going to need all three of these things for implementation. And work is going ahead um, with our RSC and the National Libraries and other communities to develop um, these tools. So this is the uh, definition of an application. Um, RDA, an application profile specifies the entities, elements, and vocabulary and coding schemes that are expected in a set of uh, metadata that meets the functions and requirements of an application that uses the metadata. So in practice, that could look something like this. Um, so we have a label which contains a link to the RDA element. We have um, an identifier for the RDA element. We have the domain, which is essentially the entity that the element applies to, and the range, which, if it's a relationship, is the entity to which the element points. RDA doesn't really um, assign cardinality to um, specific elements. So it's very flexible in that respect, but a local application profile will probably intend, need to do that, particularly if it's trying to implement a particular schema such as MARC. Um, if a, there's a vocabulary encoding scheme present or to be used, then that sh will probably be listed in the application profile. And then there are different recording methods that can be used. Um, obviously within the new toolkit there are the unstructured structured descriptions, there are identifiers and there are URIs and the application profile can tell you which ones are valid. So all of that information essentially can come out of the RDA uh, registry. From an institutional perspective, um, we all use application profiles in our daily life, whether they're templates in our ILS, for example, or something else. Um, this is our kind of mock-up of what an application profile for an institution such as the British Library could look like. And, and we may actually, we're planning to develop something like this as a way of um, ensuring that we know what elements we're expecting to use for different workflows etc um, but we won't i don't expect it to be something that the catalogers see on a regular basis the catalogers will continue to work within our ils using the templates that are already defined although we may have to um, could we configure some to include new attributes i guess um, but 
so what the application profile will do, it will tell us what our recording method of choice is, and we may have more than one um, recording method that we apply to a particular element. And Mark, for example, you may um, record date of production in the 008 field as a structured description and in the um, 264 field as an unstructured description. And the, what I've simply done in those cases is, do, is repeat the elements within the um, application profile so that I can record both methods and the mappings to them. Um, RDA specifies different transcription methods. There's a basic method and a normalized method. In general, British Library policy would be to use the um, normalized method unless we were simply um, ingesting some digital uh, content, in which case we would use the basic. So from the cataloger's perspective, you would be using the normalized transcription. Um, vocabulary encoding schemes, we would specify, I don't seem to be any on this particular slide, but we will see some as we go forward. Um, and scheme, scheme and, and encoding schemes, uh, string encoding schemes rather, which is um, in this case we mean Mark 21 primarily. And then I've included a mapping to the Mark element. And I've said whether I think it should be uh, recorded or not in this context required means that you record it unless there's a good reason not to and optional means that you don't have to and good reasons not to record something would be that there is no information or it's not relevant sometimes um, we may allow people discretion in that area um, now and then the final thing is of um, be thinking about, you know, in terms of how I want to structure this information in the future, and particularly I think about workflows, I'm looking at what things are fairly generic and can be used across different workflows, and which ones might be restricted to a particular part of a, a workflow, such as an unpublished, uh, a workflow for uh, record describing unpublished uh, resource, or a workflow for describing a sound recording, those kind of um, Things can be grouped together and can be used to, um, I think, structure the workflows as we go forward. Uh, yeah, that's just what I said, effectively. <laughs> so, so then we would get a kind. Of, we would have a kind of input sheet or template, although as I said, in our own implementation, we won't be using this directly. We'll be using the existing Aleph templates that we've been using for a long time, subject to any changes we need to make as a consequence of RDA. But um, I will be using something that looks very like this uh, in the course of, this, of the next presentation. Uh, yeah, so uh, with regard to application profiles, there's an RSC application profiles working group, which I am the chair of. Um, they, we published an interim report in spring. I regret that I have been unable to take this forward very far since spring, but I still expect that we can complete the work by the end of the year. Um, many institutions and communities, including URIG, um, are developing application profiles. Um, but we would obviously hope that at the, at the, the basis of application profiles, there will be an application profile um, containing all the RDA elements that we can then build upon. Okay, so if we move on to policy statements. They specify how a community or institution will apply options or guidance within RDE. They can also specify which recording method to be used in a specific context. Although, as you've seen, I've included that in our application profile. 
because I think that policy statements are generally more specific to instructions, whereas um, recording method tends to be at an element level. Um, the British Library is a member of the toolkit technical group that's developing tools to actually ingest policy statements into the toolkit. I don't know what happened to the word there. Um, so the um, policy st statements um, are quite complex because we have to align the policy statements uh, with, in the toolkit with the text. Um, and the process by which that's achieved is quite a technically complex process. Uh, but as I say, it's going ahead with different libraries um, working on their policy statements at the moment. Um, and then you can select the policy statements that are most relevant to you. Um, for example, if you're in the UK, you may want to use the British Library policy statements or you may want to use PCC policy statements. You can choose that and you can dis they can display in your, uh, you can choose that from the, your profile and it will display in line in the uh, toolkit. So that's an example of um, what something might look like. On the left, we've got the um, RDA options. And on the right, we've got the British Library's uh, policy statements. So when we were designing our policy statements, we set some principles out. We wanted them to be as generic as possible so that we can reuse the same text over and over again in different places. That makes it much easier. That means we've got to write um, a code up for your policy statements. Um, we wanted them to be directive, tell people what they've got to do. We wanted them to be pithy and short so that people didn't have to read a great deal. And we wanted, as far as possible, to be generally applicable. We've included some exceptions and they're labelled as such, so there will be a policy statement that says apply or do not apply, and then there will be an exception which will probably say the opposite or it will have a condition or something like that. Most of the exceptions are for things that the British Library catalogers would do that might be different from what someone else would do, and or they're material specific. Um, so you see some examples of things there, apply, do not apply, that is the policy statement. <laughs> apply if applicable, that's what we use when there's a conditional statement. And apply in my son Julianus is one that's always caused great amusement to people, but sometimes um, we have to balance uh, how much information we can provide with how much time we've got to provide it. So that gives the catalogers an opportunity to exercise their judgment. And that is also um, a fairly frequent occurrence, that uh, catalogue's judgment statement, because we can't prescribe everything. There are a lot of elements in RDA, and there are a lot of options. So that's a breakdown um, of the work that we did to count all the options in RDA. Now, the, these figures are probably no longer exactly accurate because it doesn't account for some changes to the text that happened in April. It took out some options and put in some different ones, specifically around the string encoding schemes. But we've still got quite a lot of work to do on this front, and I don't expect that we will write, as at Library of Congress, as far as to do a policy for every option Um, we are, um, yeah, so we've decided to put the um, recording methods in the application profile uh, rather than in the policy statements. We're trying to, I mean, ultimately, we would probably have a um, policy statement for all options and certainly all options that we're likely to use. That work is in progress, but we're not going to be able to do that, I think, in any, I don't want to be comprehensive by the time that we may want to implement RDA, um, because the 
people planning for implementation will be the people writing the policy statements as well. So we've identified the ones where we think we need guidance most importantly. So those are things that are core to our workflows. Um, so we've got a kind of red thread that we've done to prioritize our um, choice of uh, elements and options that will need policy statements, which includes um, all the WEMI um, entities as well as the agents um, and the guidelines, RDA guidelines. So we're trying to be as comprehensive as possible, but I don't think everything will be done by the time we implement. Um, we're going to have a consistency review because as we were developing the policy statements, um, it, we probably changed our practices slightly <laughs> as we've uh, learned more about the process. So we're going to shortly have a consistency review to go back and look at some areas where we may need to uh, revise what we've done already. Um, all the policy statements need to be loaded into um, the toolkit using what's called the more bang script. Um, so that some have already been loaded as tests, um, but we need to actually code up a lot more policy statements so that they can be loaded into the toolkit. And, and that works in progress, but I need to put more resource onto it. So if I come to application profiles, we've got uh, sorry, I should say workflows. I come to workflows, they're based on the application profiles um, and will provide narrative to mediate between the cataloger and the text. So be supplemented by guidance documents um, for specific issues, um, which is the case already. It may be that those guidance documents will be more widely published than they are at the moment. Um, and it will include mark, mark examples. We're aiming to have a more consistent presentation and less detailed description than we have at the moment. They're not written yet. This is a draft of how something might look, but don't hold me to it because it was a draft that I did several months ago and uh, thinking is moving on. Um, and then we come to training, which is the next thing I'm going to talk about. So we wrote some PowerPoints um, a while ago on specific topics as part of our aiding our understanding of how RDA should be applied. And those will obviously inform our training documentation. We've provided some orientation to staff through the ALA webinars. Um, there were some orientation days held last year in Edinburgh and Birmingham, but plans for more this year were disrupted. We've discussed moving them online and we'll still be thinking about how we do that. And we're going to redevelop our own training that we've provided externally, hopefully next year, but again, that's all contingent on how things progress. Um, but our principles are that our internal training, which we will make available externally as well, will have a modular structure that will be adapted to different audiences. Um, it will be principles based and supported by uh, examples. Our general approach will be to train our trainers first so that they can train their staff. Um, the content is not nailed down yet, but it looks something like this. Core modules to cover orientation around the flow reference model and um, using the toolkit, RDA terminology, BL policy and practice documentation. And then just how to catalog with RDA using the workflows in particularly. And then we'll also be covering the co different coding methods as part of that. We anticipate that we'll need to do some additional modules. Certainly we want to cover aggregates, authority control issues, diachronic works, and time-based media. So most of these are 
things where there's significant new information or changed information in RDA. Time-based media is more of a British Library thing that may want to um, provide some additional training to staff in our sound archive. So under current circumstances, we're probably going to have to look at remote delivery for training uh, for external people and possibly internal people as well. We've recently procured a new training platform that will enable us to do this. It's not quite implemented yet, but that works, that works in progress. We have an internal training group, including the team leaders from the cataloging teams, some experienced catalogers and members of our training team and some of my staff as well. How are we doing? Sorry, I can't see my time at the moment, so how am I doing? You're fine for time, Alan. You've got another five minutes. Okay, good. <laughs> uh, so, um, just quickly, Mark and RDA. Um, there's an RDA, Mark RDA working group in progress at the moment. Thurston Young from the, my team is, on, is a member of that group. And they've been, and these are his slides, these <laughs> next three slides or so. Um, so they've been uh, looking at options for implementing LRM changes in, and RDA changes in Mark to support 3R implementation. The group is, a, is meeting regularly, um, but it's important to note that implementation of 3R is not dependent on Mark 21 changes. Some Mark 21 changes would be very helpful, but they're not essential. Um, however, some have actually actually taking place already as you're probably aware and um, manifestation statements were approved for field 81 in the bib format in june and july extension plan was approved for field 335 in both the bibliographic and authority formats at the same time and these should be in the mark 21 update 31 which is due out at the end of the year um, L and at the Mark Advisory Committee meeting, which was held in June and July this year, um, mode of issuance was also discussed and uh, the type of binding um, was discussed. And um, these were discussion papers, so they'll come back as proposals for the January meeting of the Mark Advisory Committee. Um, and you can see there that some uh, Notation has already been suggested for those elements. Um, there are other um, mark developments that will also be beneficial, although they're not necessarily coming out of that working group. So aspect ratio de designation is another one that will be of value, and illustrative content, uh, which has been for the 350 field. Um, so that those top two were actually approved in, in June and July, so those will be in the next release uh, in uh, December. And then coming back uh, as proposals in January would be this uh, sound content in field 344 uh, and form of musical notation three, field 348. Um, all of the documentation regarding those uh, discussion papers and proposals is going to be on the Mark development page if you want to look into it further. So, you know, we originally, in our innocence, <laughs> aimed to go live late this uh, year, but obviously that's not been the case since uh, it was announced that the toolkit wouldn't be available until. Um, December. Nevertheless, there remains a, a great deal to be done, and uh, none of it's being made easy, easier by um, our current uh, lockdown. Uh, so, current thinking is that, or has been, that it would be towards the end of 2021, but there are so many dependencies that I'm not going to be held to that date at this point. 
we have to coordinate our implementation with the legal deposit libraries in the UK and with bibliographic data services and our other um, stakeholders. But we will be sharing our policy spreadsheets, our training documentation, and any other user contributed content that people want to have. I think previously we actually shared our configuration uh, guide as well. I'm not sure that'll be necessary this time, but it's um, open to open to it if people want it. Um, and obviously, we also dependent on how other communities are planning. Um, we're heavily dependent on PCC, for example, in relation to NACO uh, and to some extent SACO. Um, so those will be um, dependencies on when we can actually implement. So that's uh, the end of my first presentation. So thank you for listening. <laughs> and uh, any questions, if you add them to the chat and we can discuss them later. Yes, thanks, Alan. Um, I think everybody will be very heartened to see that the British Library plan to share so much. Um, I'm getting questions about that already. Please keep giving me questions on the chat panel for the Q&A.